In this video, we'll examine the response of a clamped clamped beam, that is to say a beam that is built in at each end. We've previously examined the response of the transverse vibrations of a beam. The link to that appears above and also down below in the comments section. Using that analysis, we discovered that using a method called separation of variables, we could approximate the displacement w of x and t as a function of x multiplied by a function of time. Function of time turns out to be t of t equals c1 cosine omega t plus c2 sine omega t. It's what we get for standard harmonic motion and all the problems we've seen previously. And then we have something called w, which is just a function of x, which is known as a shape function. And we showed that the solution to this is d1 times cosh beta x plus d2 times cinch beta x plus d3 cosine beta x plus d4 sine beta x. And of course, beta and omega are related by the equation omega equals beta squared root ei over rho a. Again, all of this appears in a previous video. You can go back to that to see where it came from. So in the case of this problem, we want to look at the mode shapes and the frequencies. And let me also say that this is a problem that I would put on an exam. If you guys were students of mine and the class covered this material, 90% sure that a problem like this would be in the exam. Maybe a cantilevered beam, but the problem would be the same. Find the natural frequency and all the mode shapes, depending on how difficult I wanted to make it. Let's give these some numbers. Uh, one, two, three, and four. So the boundary conditions in the case of a clamp-clamp beam are obviously the same on both ends, and that is that both the displacement and the slope of the beam is zero. So w of zero is equal to zero, and also w comma x of zero is equal to zero. And then at x equals l, we have the exact same boundary conditions, w of l equals 0 and w comma x of l equals 0. And we'll number these 5 and 6. So what remains to be done in this problem is to take these boundary conditions 5 and 6 and substitute it into this equation for the shape function so that we can determine the constants. We have four unknowns and we have four boundary conditions. So we start off by copying equation 3 from the previous page. And the first boundary condition at x equals 0 is that the displacement w is equal to 0. And by substituting this into equation 3, everything cancels out except for the d1 and the d3. So d1 plus d3 equals 0 results from that boundary condition. And as a result, d3 is equal to negative d1. Substitute the second bound. Let me do it alongside. I think it will make it more compact. So uh, w comma x at 0 equals 0. When we take the derivative of equation 3, substitute x equals 0 into that. What survives is beta times d1 cosh of 0 plus d4 cosine of 0. Both of those are 1. You can cancel out. Um, and that's equal to 0. We can also cancel the beta. And we are left with d2 plus d4 is equal to 0, or that d4 is equal to negative d2. So substituting these results into equation 3, we can rewrite equation 3 as w of x is equal to d1 cosh beta x plus d2 cinch beta x minus sine beta x. Let's give these some numbers, 7, 8, and 9. And now we'll substitute the remaining two boundary conditions at x equals l, into equation 9. So the first boundary condition at x equals l is that the displacement w of l is equal to 0. Substitute that into equation 9 and we end up that d1 times cosh beta l minus cosine of beta l plus d2 cinch beta l minus sine beta l is equal to 0. And then let's just draw a line and do it alongside here. The final fourth boundary condition at x equals l the derivative w comma x of l at l is equal to zero as a result beta times d1 times cinch beta l plus sine beta l plus beta d2 plus beta l minus cosine of beta l is equal to zero and we can cancel the betas from each term obviously uh, let's give these some numbers 10 and 11. okay so do you notice anything about this Perhaps some of you can notice just by inspection that a solution is d1 and d2 are equal to 0, but that's kind of a meaningless solution. So here's what we're going to do. Let's turn the page and let's write this now in matrix form. 
we write it in matrix, in matrix form, we have a matrix of coefficients times D1 and D2 is equal to zero. So which one of you recognize this as the eigenvalue problem? Give yourself a point. This is exactly the eigenvalue problem. You're seeing it in a slightly different context now from what we've seen it before. But everything remains the same. D1 equals zero and D2 equals zero is a solution to the system of equations. If it's the only solution, then it's a problem. So what we need to do is to avoid trivial solutions, which is this solution that D1 and D2 are zero. We require that the coefficient matrix has a determinant that is equal to zero. Let's call this coefficient matrix A, we'll give this a number, number 12. So then we can say for non-trivial solutions, we require that the determinant of A is equal to zero, which means that D1 and D2 equal to zero are not the only solutions then. Let's number that, number 13. Okay, so we've seen this before. We take the determinant of the coefficient matrix and we set that equal to zero. How do we take the determinant? It's the product of the diagonals cosh beta L minus cosine beta L squared minus the product of the off diagonal terms, sinh beta L minus sine beta L times sinh beta L plus sine beta L, and that is equal to zero. Let's expand this out. So we get cosh squared beta L minus two cosine beta L cosh beta L plus cosine squared beta L minus well, this is just results in a difference of two squares, right? So it's the first term squared minus the second term squared. Sinh squared beta L minus sine squared beta L. We set that equal to zero. So now, just rearranging things, I'm going to keep cosine beta L, cosh beta L on the left, and I'm going to move everything else over to the right. So... Cosine beta L times cosh beta L is then equal to one half times, and I'm going to group it this way, you'll see in a second why, cosh squared beta L minus sinh squared beta L plus cosine squared beta L plus sine squared beta L. Why do we do this? Well, we know cosine squared plus sine squared, that's equal to one. What about cosh squared minus sinh squared? Anyone know? Anyone got this on your cheat sheet? That's also an identity. That's equal to 1, 2. So both of those are equal to 1. So really what's in those square brackets is just equal to 2. So that is equal to a half times 2, which means that cosine beta L cosh beta L is equal to 1. And that is the frequency equation. Call it number 14, and we'll put a box around it. From this equation, we can calculate beta, and from beta we can calculate the frequencies omega. Now, this frequency equation really is a transcendental equation because uh, the nature of these graphs are periodic and so that this solution happens multiple times. So what we do is we write it cosine beta sub n l times cosh beta sub n l equals 1 because for n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, there are infinite number of solutions corresponding to the fact that there are an infinite number of mode shapes. Let's put a box around this give it a number, number 15, and the solution to this, and this can be done graphically and numerically, I don't expect you to work it out in paper, uh, that beta NL is equal to 4.73 is the fundamental frequency, 7.8532, 10.9956, Now, if we compare that to the case of the simply supported beam, let me put it up here. Do you remember what that is? The frequency is beta N. L were actually multiples of pi, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi. So if we look at the fundamental frequency for the simply supported beam, we see that it's pi, which is about 3.14. And the fundamental frequency of the clamped, clamped beam is 4.7. Does that make sense? Well, it should be intuitive that a simply supported beam, which is just pinned at each end, is going to, in effect, be less stiff than a beam that is clamped at both ends, where not only is the displacement restricted, but so is the slope. And you're seeing that reflected in the fundamental frequency. The clamp-clamp beam is a fundamental frequency of 4.7, where the simply supported beam is pi, which is 3.14159264. Okay, and then from the betas, obviously, we can calculate the omegas. Betas and omegas can be thought of both to be frequencies.
So in order to find the mode shape, we go back to our original system of equations. This is equal to zero. And now, because the determinant of this matrix is equal to zero, in effect, the top equation and the second equation are the same. They're just multiples of one another. Doesn't matter which one we pick, we'll pick the top one. The top equation reads cosh beta L minus cosine beta L times D1 plus cinch beta L minus sine beta L times D2 is equal to zero. And now we can write D1 in terms of D2, right? We just bring this to the other side with a negative and we divide by this. And because we can solve for D1, we can go back to our equation here, this equation number nine, and we can substitute D1, which is now in terms of D2 back in there. Okay, so if I do that, it says Wn of x, the shape function, I can pull the remaining constant out now and just call it D sub n. Why? Because there will be a different constant for each mode shape. And then it's just sinh beta, uh, beta nx minus sine beta nx plus then this coefficient that we found here, right? That would be sinh beta nl minus sine beta nl divided by cosine beta nl minus cosh beta nl. And you will notice the order of this has changed because there was a minus sign that got incorporated there. Okay? And all of this is multiplied by cosh beta nx minus cosine beta nx and lo and behold, that is your eigenfunction, your function of mode shapes for the clamp-clamp beam. Let's just give these some numbers. Uh, what's that? 15, 16, 17, 18, and a box around it. Yeah, and again, just to compare this to the case of the simply supported beam, in the case of the simply supported beam, the mode shape was a much more simple function. W sub n of x is equal to C sub n sine beta sub n x. Okay, so I went through this really quickly, and this was by design because I didn't want you to get too lost in the math. I wanted you to follow the flow of what's going on. That said, I do want you to go through the math. I suggest you go through it line by line because, as I mentioned earlier, if you were one of my students, there's probably a 90% chance that you would get a problem like this in an exam. Maybe now that I've showed you this, I would ask you to do it for the cantilevered beam. So let's just go through this again from the beginning and try to understand exactly what we did and what the purpose is here in terms of what knowledge we're trying to get to. So in order to find the response of a clamp-clamp beam, the frequencies and mode shapes, we took our four boundary conditions. We then substituted it into this general equation for W, equation 3, to find all the constants. What we found is that we ended up with two equations and two unknowns, we could eliminate all the, the other two constants. And when we wrote it in matrix form, we find that it's the eigenvalue problem. So just to take a step back, when we looked at the simply supported beam, we found that three of these constants were zero. We only ended up with one constant. It made this part of the problem much more simple because we said if the constant can't be zero, then whatever it multiplied was zero. What makes this problem different is we ended up with two constants, and as a result, we get, this gave rise to the eigenvalue problem, which we didn't see in the simply supported case. So one of the things I'd be testing is, do you know what the response looks like, the, the mode shape function? Are you able to substitute the boundary conditions? Another plus would be to then recognize this as the eigenvalue problem and to know how to handle that. Um, down here, I would expect you to know this identity, cosine squared plus sine squared is one, maybe not so much cosh squared minus sinh squared. So what I might do in this sort of a problem is I might say, show that the transcendental equations for the frequency of a clamp-clamp beam can be given by this. Cosine beta L times cosh beta L is one, and then you should be able to infer that this must be one based on everything else. I'd probably do it to you in that, in that manner. Or I might say, hey, for a cantilevered beam, this is what it is. We then found that the solution to this transcendental equation gives rise to a whole bunch of solutions. For each one of these, you can go and get the omega. And again, that's from the original equation we had on the first page here. Once we have the omega, then we can go and solve for the mode shapes and then plug that all in to get the shape function W sub N of X. And so in concluding, I thought just to make this a little bit more real, I would plot out the first five mode shapes for you. These are they for the clamped clamp beam. 
Comparing that to the simply supported beam, you can see the mode shapes of the simply supported beam are more pure sine waves. They go up, they're not uh, zero slope. And just for interest, I thought I would add the cantilever beam, since maybe you want to do this as an exercise. You can see the cantilever beam has zero displacement, and then clearly at the tip, um, there's zero curvature, and there's obviously a displacement there. So for the cantilever beam, the frequency equation is given by cosine beta L times cosh beta L is equal to minus one. I would recommend as an exercise that maybe you try that, go through the math, you know what the equation is. If I gave this to you an exam, show that the frequency equation for the cantilevered beam is given by this. That would be a very typical exam question. So that's all I want to say about this video. I hope you've found something useful in it. If you have, please will you give us a like so that others can get to see it. If you'd like to be notified of future videos as they come out, please hit the subscribe link below and click on the bell. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms for me, I'd love to hear about them in the comment section below. Thank you for watching and I will catch up with you in the next video.